What I'd like to do next is my great honor to introduce Clayton Coleman. He is the core contributor to Kubernetes out of Red Hat. He is our uh, Kubernetes expert. And as a matter of fact, he is a unicorn. You might hear about unicorns in his session. So at this point, let me turn it over to Clayton Coleman. Clayton, you're next on stage. Welcome to the stage, Clayton. Thank you very much, Burr. Fantastic. It's good to see you here. So good this point, you. you can screen share. Clayton's hanging out at the beach, by the way, if anyone's wondering what's <laughs> going on here. He's hanging out at the beach, going to be live streaming to us from there. But go ahead and get started. Go ahead and do the screen share, and you're right in there. Great. Thank you very much, Burr. All right. So OK. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, this is the first uh, conference talk I've ever given from a couch. Um, I am not wearing my pajamas right now, but maybe if this goes well enough, well enough, the next time I'll do this in my pajamas. So, um, you know, this I was really um, excited uh, to give this talk. Um, I love giving exciting talks about boring things. Um, I know it's pretty weird. You know, if you hear me say Kubernetes is boring, um, it sounds kind of crazy. You're like, no, 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 Kubernetes is the coolest thing in the world. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I mean by um, when I say I want Kubernetes to be boring, and I'll talk about what. Um, what we want to be exciting and just you know it's a useful way of thinking about um you know how we build kubernetes and, and what's coming next and what's out there in the ecosystem for people so all right so uh i know that this is um a pretty uh, diverse audience we got folks from all over the world i'll do a quick uh, run through you know a little bit of you know what is kubernetes just so we we're all on the same page uh so kubernetes uh, is a really fancy word in greek for helmsman um, we're very clever about that. You know, every project in the Kubernetes ecosystem has also felt that they need to have a really clever name, um, and we're starting to actually run out of Greek words. Um, so I think at this point we're ready to move on from that. So if y'all want to do Latin next, um, or if we want to try a more exotic language, I think that'd be a great idea. Uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestrator, um, and is really just a fancy way of saying uh, it runs little tiny Linux and Windows processes on multiple machines. Um, it runs everywhere. Uh, the project was started and inspired um, by some work um, that had been going on at Google and at other companies as well, right? You know, Google doesn't have a monopoly on all um, the world's software, and we'll talk about that later. And uh, it runs in a lot of different places, as Burr showed. So um, that's kind of what it is, but what does it do? Um, and you know, I'm going to try and really quickly to explain it in a way that even these consultants can understand it. And you know, if, if we think about Kubernetes, um, you know, why do we do Kubernetes? What was the point? Um, I would probably say it's, we're trying to make it really simple uh, to run your apps. And unfortunately, the world is a really complex place and I'll get to that in a little bit, you know, so I say simple and a bunch of you out there are like, Kubernetes is hard, it's crazy, it's so complex. Um, and we'll talk about, you know, some of the details of where that complexity comes from and why, but, you know, you wanna be able to scale your apps up and down. So, you know, if you're, you start small, you're running as a developer, but then you want to go Google scale, right? You want to you want to take on the entire world. You know, your startup hits it big, or you're um, you get a big load of traffic. You want to be able to go from one to five to ten, just like Burr was showing us. Um, but it's not not it's not enough just to scale up or down, right? You need to roll out new software. Um, you know, nothing ever stays the same. If you just do one version of software, what's the point? So we are definitely um, in a world where you know change is constant. Um, software is getting developed. Um, and things go wrong. And when things go wrong, you want something to uh, to fix that, right? So I, I want to be able to design my application so that if it fails, something fixes it. And Kubernetes can help do that. Um, you know, we talk about um, you know having multiple machines. Um, you know, very few of us actually run software on a single machine today. Maybe we do when we're testing or developing it, and we push it out to the world, right? You know, there's um, there's more machines than there ever were. I might have one under my desk and my laptop, but then I push it to the cloud or I've got a data center um, and somebody set up the machines for me, or maybe I've got some um, machines racked in a colo. And um, when you run all these applications, you kind of want to share the resources. And this, you know, I talk about apps, um, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, we could do this with virtualization. And you're right, you could do it with virtualization. And containers are just a little bit smaller a little bit faster, a little bit easier to run on your laptop. Um, if you if you develop in Linux like I do, um, or even if you're running on Windows or Mac, um, you can get a little bit more efficiency. Everything's a little bit faster. And you know, as developers, um, you know, I say this myself is I love fast things. Like I want to be able to quickly iterate. I want to be able to to fix things and keep going. And so, 
you know, a lot of um, a lot of where we're moving forward is, you know, Kubernetes isn't perfect, and it's certainly not something that's brand new and novel, right? Because um, you know, the things I've described, people have been doing this for years. Um, you know, you could do this with a Bash script, you could do this with Ansible or Chef or Puppet. Um, you can build your application, and your operations team could push it out to the world. You can write lambdas. You could uh, use Cloud Foundry. Um, we've done this a lot of ways before. I think the goal of Kubernetes, um, to summarize, is uh, it's not novel. What it's trying to do is say, when you get to the point where you're tired of reinventing all these things, and some people are and some people aren't, you can use Kubernetes and it'll handle it for you, which allows us to move on and focus on our applications. So uh, you know, another question I get all the time, is Kubernetes for me? And this is a hard one, right? If you go to certain uh, forums out there, if you go to Hacker News, you're going to get a lot of discussions that say, no, don't use Kubernetes, or I tried Kubernetes and I failed. And I think there's some, some truth in that, right? We have to think about, um, you know, what is the purpose of Kubernetes? Who does it help? What are we trying to get done? So um, I've kind of boiled it down to these three groups. Um, if you're a team and you want to run a lot of services, and services is just another way of saying applications, right? You know, sometimes your applications um, are only used by internal people um, at your team, or sometimes they're used by people outside. Uh, oh, look, we got a little bit of sun. Look at that. Um, sometimes those applications only run inside your environment, and sometimes they go out to the world. So when you run these services and applications, um, you want to share stuff. You as a team, um, you know, maybe there's a few people on your team that are your DevOps engineers or they're your admins, and they want to they want to have the standardization um, and share it with you. Or if you want to put in place these tools because you've got you know you're coming up with some challenges and you want to have these um, you want to have this automatic stuff going on, um, you're ready for Kubernetes. Uh, just like that, um, you know, a similar problem is uh, when you scale it up. So enterprises have been doing this for a long time. I said Kubernetes isn't new. There's people out there that have been running hundreds of thousands of applications for 20 or 30 or 40 years. And in those scenarios, those teams, they've got a bunch of old stuff and they've got people building new stuff, right? That, that new team, they may be thinking they may be starting out. They're building something awesome and exciting in, in JavaScript. And that enterprise infrastructure team might have something written by somebody 20 years ago uh, in Java 4.0 or something like that, or Java 1.2 that you know, they don't want to update. And so you know, Kubernetes can help appeal to both these audiences because it's trying to put in place that, you know, I don't want to reinvent that particular wheel. I want to share it. And then the third category, and this is my favorite group, and I hope uh, some of you are in this category, is people who are excited about anything. You're going to take Kubernetes and you're going to run it on your phone. You're going to run it on a sprinkler head. You're going to run it uh, on your refrigerator. Um, I respect that, um, and that's awesome. Uh, generally, those are people doing it for the love of the game, as it were. And um, we're going to stay focused mostly on this first, uh, these first two groups because enthusiasts will do anything. So the answer is yes, uh, Kubernetes might be useful for you. But like any technology, uh, you really have to think about it before you go in, which is there is no magic, right? This is Kubernetes is a tool. Um, it's a complex tool because it does some interesting and important things. Use it when you're ready to use it. Don't just jump into it. And don't just expect it's going to make your world easy and magic, no matter what Bird tells you. So uh, Kubernetes isn't magic. It's got no unicorns. Um, it probably isn't going to make you into a unicorn. Um, so why is it boring? What do I mean by boring? I like to think of um, this in terms of an analogy of um, what do we mean when we say boring? Because um, the flip side of boring is exciting. So I think about all the things uh, when I fly, and I haven't flown recently, right? The rest of us have been stuck in our houses for six months or so in the US, and flying is this distant thing that I vaguely remember, but I'm gonna try and, I'm gonna try and reach back into my memories and see if I can uh, draw an example here. So there's, there's one part of flying, which is you get to where you're going. Uh, you see your family, uh, you see a friend that you haven't seen, you go, uh, you go out to a, 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 a museum or you go see some uh, awesome scenery, you take pictures. Um, that's the kind of exciting that I think about when I want a trip. The kind of exciting that I don't want is I don't want to fly through storms. I hate flying through storms. Every time that plane drops, I panic. And so um, the kind of exciting and boring that we're talking about here is we want the flying itself to be boring, no storms, no crazy stuff. And we want the destination to be exciting, right? Because at the end of the day, um, you know, 
Kubernetes is a simple model for building and running applications. I don't want too much excitement, right? Because I got to get the stuff running. I got more important things to do. Um, the enthusiasts, right? They're excited about the journey and they're ready to take on, find new problems and go fix stuff. So um, as always, um, you got to break the world into two things. There's what you're trying to get done and then how you do it. And sometimes, you know, we, we get really excited about our tools, but it's not the most important part for most people. Uh, so I'm going to stop. I've gone in about 10 minutes um, and I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, if you don't, if you haven't uh, seen one of my talks before, um, my name is Clayton Coleman. I've been working in Kubernetes uh, since uh, very nearly the beginning. Um, before that, I actually worked at Red Hat on uh, OpenShift, which has changed over the years. Before it was built on top of Kubernetes, it was just what we call platform as a service. And to be honest, platform as a service is just a fancy way of saying a simple app, mo app model that keeps my stuff running. Um, so the goals have been the same and the technology has changed. Um, I like to take, uh, you know, if anything great happened in Kubernetes, uh, it was because of all the awesome people who contributed. If it was bad, it's definitely my fault. Blame me, and I'm sorry in advance. Um, you know, I've been talking about Kubernetes being boring. You might have seen a KubeCon talk that I did uh, a few years ago. And to me, um, boring is very personal because, you know, as someone working on Kubernetes, uh, working at Red Hat, you know, we take Kubernetes and we give it to those big, crazy enterprises that run hundreds of thousands of applications. Um, and many of them have been running on Kubernetes for a lot longer you think, uh, than you think. They run pretty critical applications on it. And um, you know, uh, just as a real uh, visual here, you can see my picture before Kubernetes. And then um, you know, after six years of working on Kubernetes, um, this is what I ended up looking like. And I don't sleep much at night anymore because um, the act of developing Kubernetes, right? Like these big complex environments, um, they're very exciting and exciting has given me some gray hairs. So um, part of my goal, the entire time that I've been working on Kubernetes and other folks at Red Hat has been, um, how do we simplify it? Um, we've got these great ideas, um, but you know, as we all know, um, we're as developers, as builders, as creators, uh, we have great ideas. They don't always work out like we anticipated. So the process of making Kubernetes boring has taken a while. Um, you know, I'd say right now, six years in, we're mostly boring, right? We're not, we're not completely boring. Um, I, just the other day, I was reading someone's uh, three years with Kubernetes journey, and they had some exciting things that they hit. Um, but you know, after 20 releases, um, I think almost 100,000 commits in Kubernetes, um, something or over 100,000 issues in Kubernetes, and I don't even know how many commits. Um, we've built something that's mostly predictable, mostly stable. Um, it's extensible, and there's a thriving community of users and contributors and companies and individuals and passionate enthusiasts that supports that community. Um, but what's really clear is, you know. While the journey of getting Kubernetes from super exciting inside Kubernetes and to people running it to boring inside Kubernetes, it's still exciting for a lot of people out there in the community is done or is mostly done. Um, I don't think the Kubernetes mission is finished at this point. And so um, this is the exciting part for me. Um, and uh, you'll have to excuse me, I get really passionate about this. And um, it's kind of an it's kind of a, how do I say this, like an esoteric concept, right? Which is, what are the things that, why did we do Kubernetes? What's the point of all of this? Like, why are you here today? You know, you want to make your, your lives better. Um, how does Kubernetes fit into that? So um, I'm going to draw a box on screen, Kubernetes. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about Kubernetes. You're going to hear a ton about Kubernetes. I bet you you've seen breathless articles and panicked articles. And I talked about all those people out there who love to hate on Kubernetes. Um, at the end of the day, Kubernetes is just a tool. Um, we use Kubernetes. Everybody looking into this camera right now, um, you're the people that Kubernetes is for. And not just Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes isn't the be all and end all of the universe. Um, you're using um, languages, frameworks, uh, other tools. Uh, maybe you don't want to use Kubernetes because Kubernetes is too hard. Maybe you love Kubernetes and you spend all of your time uh, improving it. Um, the point of Kubernetes is to make your lives easier. And one of the things that I try to think about a lot is, are we succeeding at that? And this is where we have a superpower. 
all of us. Um, I pointed out to everybody in the audience and I'm gonna look directly at you. Uh, you and we, you know, as a group, is what is actually building Kubernetes and those tools and those languages. Um, you know, when I started at Red Hat 10 years ago, I'd have conversation with people. They'd be like, tell me about this crazy open source thing. They didn't quite believe. But I think as um, builders out there in the ecosystem, we know that everything that we do is dependent on open source. The cloud providers depend on it. The giant corporations depend on it. And every day, somewhere, you're using open source tools and technologies. Uh, it is the it is the foundation of our modern world is open source. And open source really does have a superpower because open source, um, it makes everything better. It's free. Those are great. Um, you know, there's a bunch of people who love talking about how exciting open source um, is and how much it does for the world. But the superpower in open source, actually, I think is, is our secret. So um, there's this concept, and you've probably heard this in the news, you know, of, um, and we've talked about this a lot, um, the technological singularity. And it's this idea that, um, you know, we're getting better and better at writing machines, and someday we're going to make machines that think. And then those machines are going to get smarter and smarter. And then at some point, those machines are going to get so smart that they can start building new machines. And then us humans, depending on whether you're a cynic or an optimist, aren't useful anymore. Um, that's the Terminator scary version of the world. Um, or it's going to lead to a technological utopia where magic happens and we do actually all become unicorns. I'm a little bit more of a realist, which is probably pretty far away. But I will say that um, if you think about what we do as open source developers, um, that singularity is actually happening today. And it's not some fancy, crazy topic. It's us as people, when we build tools and we share those with other people, and those people use those tools, uh, file bugs on those tools, improve those tools, that loops back. And the end result is um, our tools get better. But when we improve the tools that we use to make the tools, we get better faster. So maybe it's a little bit slower and probably a little bit less scary than the, the vision of machines improving machines. Um, we as people in open source are improving our lives. And so, you know, it's really important that we think about how we're doing that and how do we do that better? So uh, I don't have a whiteboard, you know, I'm sitting on my couch in this, in this beach, um, you know, it's been a, can't get into my office. Um, it's been a crazy year. I tried to sketch out really quickly a bunch of concepts around Kubernetes that are relevant for development. And these are all things I think about. Um, Kubernetes doesn't magically solve these problems. Um, in fact, some of these problems might not be solved by any project uh, by itself. But they're concepts that you have to know if you're running applications. And there's definitely concepts that um, are important, right? Like I'll just pick one, um, data privacy. Data privacy is a huge issue, right? All of us are thinking more about how the data that we take um, to make develop, you know, our users' lives better or our own lives better, um, how that gets stored. Are we responsibly handling that? There's no magic bullet for data privacy. And so, you know, if you think about Kubernetes, um, it's trying to do some things to make running your apps easier, but it doesn't do anything for data privacy. Um, open source as a group, a lot of these, you know, if I think about these topics, I think we need to do better at encoding in our tools and encoding in how we build our tools, the concepts that actually make everything about app development easier, right? That's what's going to make us more productive. If I have to train um, someone about data privacy, they might get it wrong. And so the more that we can encode in our tools, actually, the more productive we are at building applications. And uh, some really concrete examples, um, you know, if Kubernetes is just a tool, if the point is to make us all better at running applications, um, we want it to be easy to go from development to production. Um, we want it to be easier to debug your running applications. Uh, if you're in a big enterprise, um, you have to think about this. Maybe you don't think about this as independent developers or in small companies, but you want self-service, right? You know, you, you got a you got a credit card that's going to a big cloud provider or a purchase order, and you got a budget, and you got to work within that budget. How do you give your developers and your admins the flexibility to get their job done um, without being unreasonable about it? And you want to track the security of all the open source software you have. Um, these are all problems we all have. Kubernetes doesn't magically solve these today, but it kind of moves the needle forward. 
a lot of us have these tools already, but they're different tools. And I think one of the things that's really important to think about Kubernetes and where we're going is um, Kubernetes is about taking the common ideas of developing applications and every day going a little bit further, making it easier for you to standardize some or all of these tools, right? And you don't have to use Kubernetes. Um, but the exciting part is if we can do our jobs well in the open source ecosystem, we make ourselves more productive, but then we get that little bit of extra, that superpower I talked about in open source. So I'll give a few examples. Uh, Kubernetes, um, when you deploy your app, you know, your application Bersha, an example of this, you can run multiple instances of your app. And you do that for resiliency or for, for scale out. And then Kubernetes has a concept called a service where you group all those together. Um, one of the awesome things that happened as Kubernetes evolved was um, you could bring in new concepts, right? So as a developer, I set up, um, you know, in Kubernetes, they're called deployments and replica sets. Uh, in Knative, they're called services. And I set up these instances and I recorded that in Kubernetes. And then a curious thing happens. So Prometheus is an open source tool for monitoring software. It makes it really easy to do ad hoc scraping of metrics. Um, super great tool. Um, we love working with it. But Prometheus, instead of you having to go write out the rules for each of your instances, with Kubernetes, Prometheus could actually just ask Kubernetes where all your instances are. And this doesn't seem like it'd be that much of a superpower. But what actually happened was I did something that benefited me for Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes kept my app running. And then someone else came along and made Prometheus able to read from Kubernetes. So now I don't have to do anything extra if I add metrics to my application. Prometheus could just start scraping it. And you know, this is um, there's only so much magic out there, but I think the real magic of Kubernetes is how uh, I did something that benefited me and the open source ecosystem was able to build around that to use the abstraction I used and as a good abstraction, it meant there's more power available uh, as I go. And this actually shows up in other concepts in Kubernetes as well. Um, you know, Burr mentioned Istio, Istio is a service mesh. And service mesh is just a fancy way of saying, hey, we're gonna stick a proxy in the middle and run all the traffic over it. But when you do that, you can have a richer experience around your inner application traffic. Um, so, service meshes in Kubernetes, there's like six of them these days, they actually use Kubernetes to inject that proxy so that things can talk. Your application didn't need to know about it. And that's actually a superpower too, because if you come along, all of a sudden, um, because it's just another Kubernetes component, we injected that service mesh proxy, but the Prometheus instance we had set up before, it doesn't care, it just sees that new Kubernetes component. So. Um, if I wanted to scrape metrics from both my instances and my service mesh, uh, Prometheus can do that. And I didn't really have to do that myself. So this idea that we can build abstractions that make all of us more powerful is I think the key of Kubernetes. I think we're gonna see more of it. And it gets me really excited because everybody in the ecosystem who's building, you know, these hundreds of technologies that are out there in the landscape, you know, everybody's out there trying to make something that helps them. Um, there's a real opportunity for us with Kubernetes and open source and Red Hat among the folks on this um, presentation is building these concepts that benefit all of us together is part of what makes open source powerful. And um, you know, I felt like if I was just gonna show that landscape diagram, I wasn't gonna talk about any examples. Um, it'd be kind of a, of a tease. So I just picked out four random ones, the things I think about day-to-day, uh, -day, things that Red Hat uh, is kind of thinking about. Uh, and I'll just give a quick example of each. You know, What if when you designed your Kubernetes application and you ran it on a local cluster or you ran it on a production cluster, you know, you do some YAML, you might use Helm, you might use GitOps, there's hundreds of tools you can use. What if there was a higher level that lets you um, Pretend like you were talking to a Kubernetes cluster, but under the covers, all of that stuff um, got handled for you. So instead of you talking to a real cluster, you talk to some abstraction and said, oh, I'm a real cluster. Hey, I'm not really a real cluster. And it does the scheduling. It figures out where you want to run if that cluster failed, or for instance, if you wanted to move from Amazon to Google, or you wanted to go from the East Coast of the US to uh, Western Africa, you could do that transformation simply by saying, oh, I don't really care where this runs and the system can manage it for you. So this isn't a new concept, right? People have been trying this in the Kubernetes and open source ecosystems for years. That abstraction, we don't quite have it yet, but if we can make it work, if we can as a community 
come up with a few of these ideas and join them together, um, you could get magic, and I say magic uh, in its most exciting form, you could have applications that automatically move around the world um, to where it's lowest cost or where things are still running. And maybe your local development environment, um, I talked about that first story, uh, you know, I wanna go from my laptop to production and have nothing break. I think we can get a lot better at making it easy to develop applications locally and moving them to production. And abstractions like that can help us do it. Um, describing your service dependencies, right? You know, we depend on databases and we depend on caches and object storage and a hundred other technologies. Today, we don't really have a great abstraction that says, yeah, I want to go talk to SQL. But what if there was one that working well with Kubernetes could kind of bridge that gap? Um, and we've tried this a couple of times. They've been somewhat successful, and that's the beauty of open source. Is we don't have to be right the first time. We just have to keep trying. So those service dependencies, we're not quite there yet, but I could see a point in the future where you say, I need to talk to a Postgres compatible SQL database. And in production, you're talking to the one that your services team set up um, maybe as a cloud provider service. And in your staging environment, that's a separate copy that has a subset of your data. But in test and development or on your local laptop, maybe it's a slimmed down version of your tables. Um, and we haven't really put that abstraction into place. So kind of just making stuff up. But that's what gets me out of bed every morning is thinking about how can we take some of the abstractions for stuff all of us do every day and build it into our tools so that we all benefit. And we make everybody else able to benefit too. So uh, in closing, and this isn't, this isn't really a closing because there's a ton of work left to go do. Um, we have more tools, more power than ever before. You, the builders, are able to, um, to do things that 30 years ago, everybody would say that you're crazy. Um, Kubernetes is a great tool. It's boring. It's a foundation. But there's so much more that we have to do. And the key point is, as these things get more complex, how do we, as developers, as open source members, as creators, as thinkers and dreamers, how do we build things that make us more powerful and help us build our software for the future? Because if everything's getting more complex, we're going to need a lot of help. So this has been um, a phenomenal opportunity. I want to thank everybody here for showing up today. There's a bunch of great demos coming. And you know, at its heart, um, Red Hat is just another open source company. You and us together, um, we're gonna build the future. Thank you.